Good morning, Follow Me Church. It's such a blessing this morning to bring you God's Word. I want to encourage you all to please get your Bibles. If you haven't got it ready, um, get some paper, pen. Um, you'll be writing a few scriptures down. And also I want to encourage our Kingdom Warriors, our little ones. Um, I hope you enjoyed this morning's Kingdom Warriors on YouTube. Uh, God bless you amazingly as you uh, look at timelines through the Bible. But um, this morning, church, I'm going to focus on a word that God gave me uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was reading, um, when I was studying his word. And I feel very led this morning to actually um, share this word with you. And I pray that it will bless you amazingly. So this morning's scripture is taken from the book of Haggai, and I've timed my message, God's signet ring, God's signet ring. I must admit that when I've read Haggai many times, but when I read it again two weeks ago, I realized at that point in time that I wasn't actually, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I was, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't at a time and place, uh, probably possibly at that time, when this word was revealed to me. But when I read it two weeks ago, I was actually on my knees and I was starting to look at the temple being re rebuilt in, in, um, in Jerusalem. And this word really stood out to me that we are God's signet rings. And I want to bring you that word this morning. Haggai chapter 2. 20 to 23 and God's word says and again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month saying speak to Zerubbabel governor of Judah saying I will shake the heavens and the earth and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. What a wonderful promise to Zerubbabel at this time. Church, there are many examples in the Bible where it talks about a ring, the signet ring. To give you a few examples, Joseph, when he had interpreted Pharaoh's dream of seven years of famine, the king was so pleased in Genesis 41 that Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and he put it upon Joseph's hand and then clothed him with fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot and people bowed to Joseph as he went along. You see, at that time, Pharaoh handed power and authority to Joseph by taking out his ring and putting it upon Joseph. I look at the prodigal son. Sure, he went away and, and spent all his money and did a lot of things. But when he came back to his father, the word of God says, the father called the servants and said, bring forth the best robes. And then he said, he took the ring and put it on his hand. Again, it's a restoration, a, a, a signet, a sign that it's going to be okay, that you are back into fellowship, that there's restoration that's happened and power being given as the son of the house. I look at uh, Esther and Mordecai. Esther, for example, when Haman was killed in Esther 8.2, it says that the king took off his ring, which he had given to Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai and, and, and set him as an important part of the kingdom. Also, it says in Esther 8.8, 8, the king says to Mordecai, Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you. In other words, you have the power to write anything you want because I have given you the authority of this ring. In the king's name, in the king's name you will write and seal it with the king's ring. The king is giving him power, giving him authority to write. 
for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse because it was binding, it was legal. I look at Jezebel when in 1 Kings 21, the evil queen Jezebel, she took King Ahab's signet ring and she wrote letters on behalf of Ahab and sealed them with Ahab's signet. In other words, sealed them with Ahab's power and authority. I look at Daniel, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den in Daniel 6, it says that the king took his ring and he sealed the wax on the on the on the uh, the, the mouth of the of the den with his ring with his imprint and he also got his lords to take their signets and to seal it that it might not be ever overturned i want to leave this thought with you when i finish this sermon today do are you god's signet ring are you carrying the power the authority that god has given you why are you carrying Jesus? Are you shining that light bright and strong that points to him? And that is what the crux of my message is this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we come before you. Lord, there are numerous examples in the Bible, numerous examples that dictate what power and authority came with the signet ring. And Lord, this morning, we recognize that as you chose Zerubbabel, he said, I will make you a signet ring. Lord, today we say to everyone that is listening today, to every person in Follow Me Church or even otherwise throughout this world who are listening to this message, Father, that you will make them a signet for you, for your glory. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit power. Fill me to overflowing. Use me as your vessel this morning to deliver what you have put upon my heart to your people. Speak, Lord. All of us are listening to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, church, what is a signet? What is a signet ring, as some people call it? You see, it's a ring in itself that has markings that identify a specific person or a family. It, it says, this is who you are. It's an identification ring. Often it can have an emblem crested onto it. It can have a name and a, and a diagram that says, this is who I am and this is my authority. The signet ring throughout history has been used by kings to make laws and to pass laws. And they would often seal it with hot wax so that the imprint would be on it. They would set seals and then such seals were legally binding. They would send forth word and send forth edicts and proclamations through that signet ring. The scrolls would be opened up after that signet ring was pressed into hot wax to seal it. Often uh, when there's a change in command to a level leadership, it would be done through a signet ring being pressed onto hot wax. It's used to designate authority, honor, and ownership. But I want to bring you back to the background of Haggai 2, 20 to 23. Why did the prophet Haggai come to Zerubbabel and give him this word? You see, the late in the late 6th century, it was a perilous time for Judah. The Persians had allowed the Jews to return to their land, but, but even though they had returned to the land, the Jews had, were still under the control of the Persians. Zerubbabel, who was the son of Sheatil, the son of Jeconiah, remember that name, Jeconiah, because it's a very important name. So Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah at that time. And yet things were not entirely right. The Persians had ruled the land of Judea. The Jews could not govern themselves. All their taxes, for instance, were being provided to the Persians, to a foreign king, to a foreign army, and one that might oppress them in the future or at any given time. And prior to this, even when they were back in their homeland, when, when they were released from exile into their homeland, it still seemed as if God's promises of restoration were yet to be fulfilled. There was nothing moving. Everything had come to a standstill. And shortly after being restored to their land from captivity, the people of Israel started to rebuild the Lord's temple. 
Cyrus had issued a decree that the exiled nation would return to their homeland. So Zerubbabel and Joshua helped build the, the altar. And in the second year, they also helped lay the foundation. But then the building stopped. Once the foundation was laid, the building stopped for 16 years. The reason was because people, there was a group of people who rose up in opposition to trouble them. There seemed to be absolutely no way out. And the people soon turned their time and their money to their homes and their businesses. And they left God's temple unfinished and in a very poor condition. In fact, they were miserable. They, God and his kingdom were not their first love anymore. Because of their self-centered lives, the Lord started to withhold his blessings from his people. They worked really hard, but they saved little. They had little to show for it. When what they did produce no longer satisfied them. And after 16 years of this apathy, in, in Israel was called to get right with God. But holiness church does not come from having a nice building or attending services. It comes from a personal trust in the promises and the work of our Lord. You see, even though they had lived selfishly for 16 years, God said it was not too late. God still came through. The Lord's warning to Israel through Haggai is actually a word of grace. It's a word of mercy to his people. And he's calling Israel to serious obedience to his word. You see, though they had suffered because of their disobedience in the past, obedience now and in the future will bring a blessing and the promises of God will come to pass. So Zerubbabel represented hope. There was hope, hope was gonna come through. And if I look at Zerubbabel, I look at first and second Kings, and you can actually read this in your own time. And the last part of second Kings ends with uh, Zerubbabel's great grandfather, or grandfather, Jeconiah. I told you to remember this name before. Jeconiah, as the word of God says, was not a good king. He was not a man after God's own heart. In fact, Jeremiah says he was a terrible king in Jeremiah chapter 22. You can read that for yourself. And in fact, his prophecy in Jeremiah 22 about Jeconiah is that Jeconiah will be cast out of this land and he will die in another land. He will not prosper, nor any of his descendants will prosper and will no longer sit on the throne of David. Very important church for you to remember this. Jeconiah did not please the heart of God. And God said, I'm going to remove you. You won't even die in your own country. You will be cast away in another country. And when you get cast away in another country, there will be none of your descendants will prosper. You will not even prosper. And most of all, you will not sit on the throne of David. A very, very important point. Of particular significance is in Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 25, the Lord says, that if Jeconiah were a signet ring, this is what God's word says, if Jeconiah, this is Zerubbabel's grandfather, if he was a signet ring, this is what the word of God says, the Lord says that if Jeconiah were a signet ring on his hand, he would cast it off and he would give that signet ring to those who seek Jeconiah's life, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Wow, just imagine that God's taking away whatever he was giving Jeconiah, he's going to take it off through that signet ring and give it to those who were after his or after Jeconiah's life. Now, we know through that through the story over there that Jeconiah was taken out of prison by another evil king called Evil Merodach, king of Babylon. While he was in prison, all hope from that scripture that I just read, it says, you, you know, your descendants will not prosper. You'll no longer sit on the throne of David. That was very important for you to remember because Jeconiah was put into prison for a significant period of time through the exile. But then came evil Merodach, king of Babylon, and he actually put 
pulled um, Zechariah out of prison and re and re brought him out and 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 reinstated him onto the land as in to 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 have fellowship with other people. Technically, church, the end of every of anything good through Jeconiah could have finished when he was in prison. Technically, church, Jeconiah could have been killed, as God's word said. Jeconiah, his his uh, descendants could have been annihilated, and the Davidic line could have been finished at Jeconiah. But God, in His mercy, used evil Mer Merodach to get. Jeconiah out of prison and re and bring him into, into Israel. This gave hope that perhaps God had mercy and God was going to reinstate the Davidic line because in the Davidic line was going to come a promise through this man who was originally rejected by God. In fact, th that the fact that Jeconiah was released from prison perhaps gave hope to the people of Judah that the Davidic line was somewhere, somehow going to come to pass. Now we fast forward a few years and Zerubbabel, Jeconiah's grandson, is governor in charge of Judah. Church, Haggai and Zerubbabel will both pass away. But you know something? It perhaps left people wondering was Haggai's prophecy false? The answer is no, it wasn't. In fact, Haggai's prophecy is of the greatest importance, not just to the Jews at that time and to Judah, it is of great importance to all mankind as well. You see, God had favor on Zerubbabel. God had every right every right to be angry with Jeconiah. He did not do the right thing in the eyes of the Lord. Yet it is Jeconiah's grandson, Zerubbabel, who finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this, this is what makes Haggai, Haggai's prophecy so important. And that's why God chooses Zerubbabel to make him a signet, a sign of authority. The promise Haggai makes is of great importance, church. It is far less for Zerubbabel, but far more for generations to come. And the, this was the promise that was to come. Ten generations from Zerubbabel, remember this, ten generations from Zerubbabel. So you had Jeconiah, who God said, no, nah, I'm going to take away my signet and give it out. Two generations later, Zerubbabel, God says, okay, Zerubbabel, my favors upon you. I'm reinstating you. God puts him back as a signet. Ten generations after Zerubbabel, ten gener generations, a man called Joseph is born in the same line. Now, Joseph will be the father of the one called Jesus of Nazareth, whose line is in the Davidic heritage through, through Joseph, through Zerubbabel, through Jeconiah. And this is why we see Haggai's prophecy is so important. Jesus is of the branch of David and he will rule a greater kingdom because God chose the great, 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 go back 10 generations to Zerubbabel as a signet ring. I'm saying to you this morning, church, that, though, that through Jesus, God did and will shake the world and he will destroy and has destroyed and will destroy the strength of kingdoms and nations that rise up against him. Jesus will reign over a kingdom above all kingdoms. His reign would have no end, no end whatsoever. His kingdom would have servants from every nation. Hence, I stand today as a proud servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, because I have been chosen for my for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You see, Jesus, through his life and death and resurrection, was given all the authority in heaven and on earth. And he rules over all people for all time. Because, because Jeconiah was sinful, it, it was taken away from him. But because Zerubbabel obeyed the Lord, 
You know, God chose him. God said, you will be my signet ring. You see, church, of this, you and I can be beneficiaries through our choice to follow Jesus, through our choice to serve Jesus. Let us praise God for his provision for all of us and serve Jesus as the risen Lord. How amazing it is to know that our Jesus is the King of Kings. His kingdom has no end and he is a coming back King. He is a soon coming King. So what is then church, the significance of the signet ring? You see, though God had removed the signet ring from the grandfather, God calls Zerubbabel the signet ring. But this time God says it's not going to be removed. It will not be removed. You see, in Hagar's prophecy, God is giving Zerubbabel encouragement and hope. The, the God is saying, you as a governor, I have chosen you, Zerubbabel, for a very unique and noble purpose. You, your line is going to be a very important function in the history of mankind. You see, as God's signet ring, Zerubbabel was given a place of honor and authority. Now, if you're a believer and you believe that you're God's signet ring, you have a place of honor and authority. You see, God is reinstating the Davidic line through Zerubbabel. He is renewing his covenant that he made with David. He is renewing it through, through Zerubbabel. And Judah still has a future. As they look forward to the coming son of David, the Messiah, who will one day overthrow all the kingdoms of the world. And he will shatter the power of every foreign kingdom that does not belong to him. This is Jesus, the soon coming king. So Zerubbabel, if you notice that verse, church, Zerubbabel is called my servant. How amazing for God to say, you are my servant. I have no issues with that statement because I truly believe that we as believers are the servants of the living God. You see, when, when the Old Testament refers to my servant, it is actually a messianic reference. There is a messianic reference in the my servant. God's promising his people, Israel, saying to them, I have not forgotten you. I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's why let's read Haggai chapter 2 verse 23 again. It says, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, says the Lord. And listen to this, I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Church, there are three words in this one verse that causes a triad. The three words are, you are my servant. There's a servant, a messianic prophecy of a servant who is coming. You will, there will be a son because you're the son of Sheatiel. The servant will also be a son and you will be a signet ring and he's going to be ruling with power and authority. He will carry every power and every authority that, the God, that God, the Almighty God has given to him. There's a three combination of encouragement happening right here to the people of Judah. Zerubbabel was an important leader in the reconstruction of the physical temple. But God is saying to Zerubbabel right now, you are going to be instrumental in the spiritual temple that is to come. Praise God for his word. <clears throat> Zerubbabel, therefore, is a picture of a future Messiah. As God's signet ring, Zerubbabel becomes a, a, a becomes the the um, a, a, a messianic uh, a, a future of the Messiah that is to come. But it's going to come through Jesus Christ through the Davidic line. You see, the Messiah will establish His people in the Promised Land. He will construct an even grander temple, and He will lead the righteous in never-ending worship. And you can read this in Zechariah 6. We will always be worshipping with our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. But now, church, I want to talk about the prophecy. On that same day, says the word of God, on the 24th of the month, 
came another message through to Haggai to Zerubbabel. And God's preparing Judah because a great shaking is about to bring down the mighty nations. Even when you look at the world today, church, when you look at the world today, there's going to be a mighty shaking. You might think that what's happening right now is a mighty shaking. This is nothing. You haven't seen what is to come. And the book of Revelation is very clear about what is to come. It's literally unfolding before our very eyes. So in Haggai chapter 2, the first shaking is spoken about. And it says in chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, the Lord said, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once in a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. So not just the earth will be shaken, not just the sea and the dry land, but even the heavens will be shaken. And I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. Glory is going to come in such a way that no man will be able to see God's glory. In fact, scripture says that men, kings, uh, 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 people in authority, they will run and hide and they will say to the mountains, fall on us, we'd rather die being crushed than see the glory of the Lord. Again in chapter 2, another warning comes in verse 20 and 22 in Haggai. And, and, and the prophet again brings the word. It says, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And now listen to this church. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. Every person that has exalted themselves, I'm going to overthrow. Every single kingdom that thinks it's exalted above God will be overthrown. And I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. They that exalt themselves above God will be destroyed completely. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In other words, Every chariot, the rider, the horses, all enemy nations will be destroyed by God. He would take down every pride, every confidence that man has, every worldly strength that people rely on will be crushed. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's who you and I ought to remember. Even when you look at the circumstances around you, I want to encourage you to remember the name of the Lord our God. So Zerubbabel is going to become a signet ring when this happens because he, through him, is going to come a Messiah who is going to empower his believers to be the people they ought to be. So you see, this is what I believe God is saying. God is saying, Zerubbabel, you will be my signet ring. My name will be engraved upon you. People will identify my authority in you. You will attest to the authority of royal messages, my word. My signet will prove that you belong to me. Just as a signet is inseparable from the owner and is a valuable possession, so are you to me, Zerubbabel, through you. I will preserve the Davidic line. I believe this is what God is saying to Zerubbabel and in this prophecy. You see, the promise is messianic and its primary fulfillment is that Jesus is going to come and will come at that time through the line of Zerubbabel. Davidic sovereignty will survive the shaking. In other words, no one can stop what God is about to do. God was going to provide restoration. God was going to provide cleansing to his people through a glorious temple and a messianic ruler. How wonderful it is to know that even in all these circumstances, when we think that there is absolutely nothing, God provides. Great nations will fall, but Judah will survive. Church, for you today, things around you might look terrible but you will survive because God is with you. The messianic ruler's kingdom will be an eternal kingdom. Look at Daniel chapter two, verse 44. It says, 
<coughs> the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. God is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdom and it shall stand forever. God's kingdom will be set up forever. In Luke chapter 1, 32 to 33, Jesus says, He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there will be no end. Hebrews chapter 12, I hope you're writing on these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. Church, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, God's kingdom cannot be shaken. You know, it, it, we have to we have to have grace by which we, God's going to give us grace by which we may serve Him with reverence and godly fear. You know, even during this time when when we're all worried about different kinds of things, I want to encourage you: do not let fear be your companion or your bedfellow. Fear has been taken, uh, put away, has been dealt with through Jesus on the cross. No matter what you see happening around you, though kingdoms are shaking, though economies are failing, God is saying, I am still there. My kingdom cannot be shaken, says God. This is why I want to encourage the work of the church today. You know, we have kingdom warriors happening. We have these online messages happening. We have midweek encouragement happening. Do you know why? Because the church... The church of God has to, make, has to make Christ known that Christ is the head of the church. He is the Lord of his kingdom. Christ is declared to be sovereign over all the universe. That's the role of the church. We proclaim daily the redeeming grace that is open to all so that they can accept that grace while they still have breath living in them. It is where the finished provision for sin is taught to people that the people might be saved and they in turn go out and save others. We, you and I, are God's signet ring. You and I, God saying today to us, you have the power and you have the authority. So what is then, church, the focus of the signet ring? You see, the signet ring reveals the everlasting and powerful truth that is found in the word of God. You know, because it has been stamped, it's been authorized, it's got ownership. I belong to Jesus. I am in God's kingdom. I belong to God's family. I am one with Jesus. You know, I, I because of that knowledge that the signet gives us, the authority and the power gives us, it reveals the everlasting and powerful truth about God. But it also reveals to us the difference between what we have believed about ourselves and what the word of God actually says. You see, sometimes and throughout life, you may go through life believing a lie about yourself until you meet Jesus. And the word of God comes alive and says, you are not what that person said you are. You are precious in the eyes of the Lord. You are created in his image. That's the kind of, of power we're talking about because you now have an identity in Christ Jesus. The signet opens our eyes to the truth. Because you know who you are and every lie, every shame, every fear will be exposed. The enemy will flee because you are now a kingdom person. You have the authority. God's given you that authority. So the signet church is yours and is available to you. And there are two things that clearly come from God's signet. The first thing, you are his beloved. God loves you. He loves you so much. And secondly, he will never let you down because he's given you that authority. We may let God down, but God never lets us down. So what are the implications of being God's signet ring? You see, what does it mean for us? How can we be equipped 
knowing that we are wearing something that identifies us with Christ Jesus. The world might be shaken around us everywhere we turn, but we must turn our eyes upon Jesus. We must keep our eyes upon him. To, in order to grow where we have been planted in this world, we must learn, church, to exercise his authority. And that was given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are planted somewhere, I encourage you to exercise your authority in that situation. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have his authority residing in us. There's no two ways about it. The word of God says it. Scripture says it. God has given Jesus the position of full authority. Now, if you don't believe me, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, 22 to 23. God has given Jesus, his son, full authority. And I'm going to bring this to where you stand. In Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, it says, And he has put all things under his feet, and Jesus' feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is the body, and the fullness of him who fills all in all. Everything is under Jesus. Everything. So if the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in us, as scripture says, God wants us to use the power of his stamp on our lives to rule and reign with him. Are you with me, church? Because I have the same power that resides, uh, that raised Christ from the dead living in me, God wants me now to be that person of authority and to use the, to use that authority to rule and reign with him. That's why even our young people are called kingdom warriors. You know, we, we, we've got power. You can tell, you know, turn to your family and say, to buy yourself, say, Lord, I thank you that I'm a kingdom warrior. You see, church, God preserves his people only because of one thing, his sovereign grace. You know, he preserves us. He keeps us because of his grace. If, if I look at Haggai chapter 2 and verse 23, the last part, it says, I have chosen you. I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. What an amazing way to end a, a, a passage, to end a book. I have chosen you. That's what God says. What an amazing grace that God's undeserved love has fallen to us, his people, because of what Jesus did on the cross. What an amazing grace that is. What an amazing thought to know that we are chosen, just like how God chose Zerubbabel, but what amazing grace to know that through the Davidic line, through Zerubbabel, through that power of that signet ring, will come a Messiah who will redeem us and give us that authority. That's why church, we ought to put God first. You see, Jesus came as the beloved Holy Son of God to take the curse of us ungrateful sinners. You know, he takes our dead hearts and he makes them alive again. We are priceless in the eyes of God. We are constantly on his mind. He, he Remember, there are millions of people, billions of people across the world today, but every one of us are on his mind. Have you ever thought about that? What it might be for this awesome God to hold every single one of you on his mind. Because God's sovereign work of saving, because of his saving grace, because of his saving grace, we do not belong to ourselves. We are not our own. We belong to him. We belong to Jesus because of God's saving grace. I want to urge you this morning to be committed to the true God of these scriptures. He is the source of every possession that you and I have. He is the source. You know, he purchased us from the grips of evil. You know, he, he, through, through the death, through his death on the cross. You know, he's the one who says, come and follow me. Come, 
come and follow me. We are his redeemed people. He's the one that stirs our heart with faith and repentance and obedience. He's the one who deserves our humble and our submissive gratitude church. He should always be first in our lives that we can be shining beacons or lights that point to him, not to us, not to say, oh, I did this and I went there and I prayed here and I wrote, I wrote this and I did that. No, everything that we do must point to Jesus not to ourselves oh, 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 oh everything else is vain it's vanity says the writer you know everything's vanity every we need to point to Jesus God should never be relegated to a remote place and to be visited every now and then are you with me church you can't say God just stay in that corner I'll just visit you when I feel like visit, visiting you I, I cannot be content with an occasional God I'm sure you cannot be content with an occasional God you know we we, we rather you would rather just reject God if that's the case if you're going to treat him as lukewarm if you're going to treat him as as a as a, uh, as, a, as, a as a occasional God what God wants from us is our full commitment to him he wants to inspire us completely he's a God that was there from the time of Noah to Abraham to to Isaiah Jeremiah to even to Matthew and Luke and John and and, and and, and to Peter and Paul, this is the God that I'm talking about, who wants our full commitment. He is not a God that passes time for the sake of passing time. He, he holds time in his hand. He wants to be the Lord of our homes. He wants to be a living savior and a sovereign king. This is who he is. He is not a part-time inspiration. Do you belong to him, church? Do you belong to him? Or do you just see God as your servant and you as the master? Whenever you want something, do you go to him and say, I want this and you dangle something. I will say 10 vows and I will climb the highest mountain. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God where we need to constantly check our lives and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it's important to ask the question, is God in my life or does he just get my leftovers? Is God in my life or does he just get my leftovers? Do you know what leftovers food, leftover food is like? You wrap it up after you've had everything and you wrap up the remaining and you put it in the fridge, maybe for another day. Or, you know, you may throw it in the bin because you had so much. You know, that you had, you already had it. Do you treat God that way where he becomes the servant and you get the leftover? He gets the leftovers. No, this is a God. He wants to bestow the wonderful grace of Christ into your lives. He, he has unconditional love to give you. You see, for the promise of eternal victory is ours. It's yours and mine. We have eternal victory. And therefore, we need to serve him. We need to put God first. And then your families will be blessed. The promises of God will come and unfold themselves. Those who depend upon their ways will be brought down. If you think that I can do this, I, I can sort this out. I am good enough for this. You will fall. But God's word says, depend on the Lord and his covenant blessings will be yours. God must be priority in our lives. God must be. Only then will an abundance become a blessing and the joy of the Lord will fill our lives again. Church, you know what Isaiah 43 10 says? You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, I am God. Before me, there's no God, no God was formed and none will come after me. He is the only way, the truth and the life. Isaiah 49, 16, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. You think about it. This awesome mighty God says, I have inscribed every one of you into the palm of my hands. Song of Solomon, God says, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. Isaiah 43, 10, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Listen to this church. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall be any after me. No one can take the place of God. 
And the last one I want to leave you with, Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Listen, O isles. I'm going to say, listen, follow me, church. Hearken, listen, you people from everywhere who are listening. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, hath he made mention of my name. In other words, the Lord has called you, even from your mother's womb, to be effective wherever you are right now. I want to leave you with the signet ring proclamation this morning. Can you say this proclamation after me? I just want to bless you with this proclamation. Just repeat after me, church. I am God's signet ring. My life is reflected of the transforming and wonder-filled journey I claim I have in the fullness of what Jesus Christ's death on the cross accomplished for me. In other words, you're saying your life is a journey of God's grace. I express the authority of the King of Kings. I express the authority of the King of Kings. I express the power of God's enduring word in the war against my ident identity. In other words, every time Satan tries to tell you that you are of no good, you've got God's signet ring ready. You know your identity. God's signet ring will expose the lies, the shame, and the fear that have kept me from living fearlessly on the front line for the kingdom of God. I have a true identity in Christ. As God's signatory, I have an identity and I speak the message of God with authority. As God's signatory, I am a representative of God's power and authority. I have been chosen and set apart to be identified with Christ Jesus. Because I have God's power and authority, I have access to everything God has for me. I am a servant of the Most High God and I have the authority to act on his behalf. I am marked with his seal. I am chosen for a unique and noble purpose. As God's signet ring, I have a place of honor and authority. As God's signet ring, I have a new covenant with the Lord. I have a future. I am the beloved of God. I find my confidence and strength in Christ Jesus. Everything is available to me. Healing, provision, strength, peace, and joy. I carry God's name with me wherever I go. I am designed in such a way that people identify Christ's authority in me. I carry with me the royal message of the word of God. I belong to Jesus. I am inseparable from his love. I have been given authority to sign his name to receive my blessing. I am sealed by God and marked to live the abundant life he has in store for me. That is God's signet ring for you this morning. I pray that you were blessed this morning with God's word.
I pray that you'll carry this message wherever you go, that you are stamped with the seal of approval of God. You walk in his power and his favor. You walk in his power and his authority. That is who God is. I pray that you will continue to be blessed in your homes as you exercise authority, as you've been placed in your families, you've been placed in your jobs for a specific season. You've been even maybe a, a mother at home. You're there for a season, but exercise your authority. For those of you who don't know and are vulnerable to the things around you, God is with you. You are marked by God. You are identified because of God in you. I pray that this word will bless you immensely. Let us pray together, church. Father God, I just lift up to you today your word that makes us remember how precious we are in your eyes. How powerful we really are. And Lord, we are sorry for the times when we come across weak or when we think that you don't exist or when we forget that you are there with us, next to us. We ask that you will forgive us, Lord. Father, this morning, I want to lift up every person that is listening to this word. Lord, I thank you for your scripture that says that every one of them has been chosen. Every one of them is like a signet ring. They carry the, your stamp, God. They carry your emblem. They carry your name. Lord, wherever they go, I pray that they recognize that they walk with your power, they walk with your name, and they walk with your identity and your authority. I thank you, Lord, that every one of our believers today who are listening in and tuned in today, Father, that their, owner, that their ownership is in you. We belong to you, Jesus. And now this morning, I pray your peace to settle upon their hearts. Let them remember that inscribed on them is your stamp and your seal of approval. Father God, we lift up our hearts and our hands today to say, Father, as you use Zerubbabel by saying that he was a signet ring for a noble purpose, I pray that every one of us, we put our hands up this morning, Lord, use us for a noble purpose. Every one of us. Bless us, Lord. Bless all the children who are tuning in. Bless all the big people as well as they listen in and follow, and follow me, church. I pray you bless the church. Bless even the believers across the world as they listen in. I pray that a blessing upon their homes, Lord, that they will remember to not look at their circumstances, but look at their identity in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your oh, tremendous word this morning. And I pray that it would bless every heart. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.